It is great to see you guys. I'm glad you're here. We're going to continue on uh, with our uh, study of 1 John. Uh, we're going to be still in chapter 2 uh, today. Uh, the title of the message today, because I love saying this phrase, is brother from another mother. Because that's what this verse, these verses are all about. It's about our brothers in Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're going to look at our relationship uh, with one another uh, and how that's supposed to work and what we're supposed to do and, and all those things like that, okay? Okay. Um, so if you will, I'm going to go ahead and read. We're going to start, uh, we'll be in 1 John uh, chapter 2, 7 through 14. I'm just going to read through 11 right now, uh, and then we'll pray and we'll get started, okay? Uh, 1 John 2, 7 through 11 says, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for... Um, uh, for allowing us to come together in a place where we have other brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to help hold us accountable, God, to help encourage us, to help grow us closer to you every single day. God, I pray that uh, as we examine this scripture that you would open our hearts, you would open our minds, open our spirits to what you have to say through this, God. And I pray that, uh, that we would begin to see our relationships uh, uh, with greater importance, our relationships with those who would call themselves believers. I pray that we would see uh, a greater importance in those relationships uh, as we move through this, God. Uh, as always, we thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's right. Amen. I like it. Amen. So, <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Now, I, our first read through on this. Uh, it, it sounds a little bit kind of like an oxymoron. Like there's a little bit of a, like it's not this, but it is this. It's not this. It isn't. How many of you guys know what an oxymoron is? You guys know what it is? Uh, so like some funny ones like deafening silence, right? Like you ever heard that? Like deafening, like that doesn't make any sense. It's silent, but, it's but it doesn't make sense. Uh, alone together. Have you ever been alone together with someone? Yeah. I mean, we say that's an oxymoron. Uh, act naturally, right? How do you act naturally? Uh, seriously funny. Have you ever heard that one? Have you ever said that one? Like, this is seriously funny. It's, you know, it's, these, these are things that, diet ice cream, which is disgusting, right? So diet ice cream is terrible. Uh, uh, pretty ugly. I've heard that one before in my life, right? Like, pretty ugly. Uh, butthead. That doesn't make any sense, because I'm, you know, airline food, Right, airline food, not not great. And then, and then obviously uh, everybody's favorite if you work in IT, Microsoft Works. Right, like, come on, bro, it's all about the MacBook now. It's all about the MacBook. But uh, so those are some oxymorons. In our first read through of this uh, this this passage here, it feels like uh, kind of an oxymoron, or kind of he's contradicting. He's saying uh, it's not a new commandment. But it is a new commandment. So, so what's he talking about there? So in, in verse 7, I'll read it again. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but what? An old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you heard. At the same time, it is a what? New commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. So have you ever read... Scripture, like part of Scripture or a passage, and you get to a part, and you like you just you can't get past it. Like your brain locks up. And you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense, and you just keep going back. When I was reading through this uh, for the first time, it was one of those moments where I was just like, what? what? Like, wh like you gotta you gotta figure it out and dissect it in your mind, and and it, it's just one of those things that just catches you off guard a little bit. And so I was trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? What what are we talking about? And and, and here's. Here's what I believe he's saying. It's, it's an old commandment for them because their entire Christian lives, they've been taught this commandment. They've been taught the commandment that John is talking about. So for them, it's an old commandment. But it's new in the fact that before Jesus laid this commandment down for them, uh, it was, wasn't there. 
When Jesus laid it down, he said, I'm giving you a new commandment. And so what he's saying is it's old to you, but to those that aren't in Christ, it will be new. It's old to you, but when Jesus laid it down at the beginning, when he laid it down during his ministry and he told us this is what we're supposed to do, it was brand new. And so what was that commandments. Uh, last week we talked about uh, one of Jesus' commandments, and, and we talked about how uh, we are marked by how we are obedient to that, uh, to the Word of God in that, in, in loving uh, the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. But there's another commandment that Jesus gives us in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And Jesus is speaking to the disciples here. And he's not saying that you need to generally love the people around you. You need to love your neighbor. This is, this, the, the words and the way it's put together gives us a different uh, connotation that where Jesus is saying, yes, you love your neighbors yourself. You, you love everybody as yourself. You love all, all these people. That's one thing. But then he lays down a new commandment, specifically saying that the disciples should love one another. That we as believers in Christ should love one another. And so that's the new commandment that John is talking about uh, in the book of John and then also in 1 John. Uh, A new commandment was laid down by Jesus to love one another. Not how we would love one another, but how who loved? How he loved. We follow his example. Love one another the way Jesus loved us. And so that's the new commandment uh, that, that he's laying in. And it's new because when Jesus displayed the love that was shown on the cross, nobody had ever seen that type of love in the world. Nobody ever experienced that type of love. Jesus on the cross was the most radical display of love the world had ever seen to that point. But it's not the only radical act of love that the world should see now. Because Jesus has commanded us to love one another as he loved us. See, we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to act like Jesus. And so Jesus' act of love on the cross is an example for us and how we are supposed to love one another. The world should look at us and say, just like Jesus said, they will know that you are with me. They will know that you belong to me because of your love for one another. Now, I want you to think about your life. Does that hold true for you? Does the world know that you belong to Jesus, not because of what you say, not because of what you wear, not because of where you give your, your, your extra money to, not because of where you spend your time, but because you love one another? Is that the case in your life? You see, just as we are marked by obedience to the commands of Jesus to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but here we see that we are also marked by a love for one another. And then later on in the book of 1 John, we're going to see that we are also marked by uh, the sound doctrine with which we preach and we live our life by. And so John is kind of setting up a a three-legged stool for us to, to base our life off of. Of, of loving those around us, loving uh, the, uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ, and practicing sound doctrine and theology in our life. And so uh, as we move forward into John, we'll get to that part. But that's what John is building for us. He's building a platform for us uh, to live our life off of, to base our life off of, so that we know how are we supposed to act, what are we supposed to do. Uh, in in uh, uh, verse 9, 1 John uh, Two nine says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in what? Darkness. If you say you're in the light, but you hate your brother, not your physical, not your, not your like the, the guy that was born before or after you. That's not what we're talking about. If you hate your brother in Christ, you are still in darkness. You see, when we come to Jesus, 
When we come to Jesus, and by that what I mean is, is when we uh, uh, believe that he is Lord and we receive forgiveness for our sins, when we come to that type of relationship with Jesus, then we enter into a new spiritual family. And that spiritual family takes precedence over anything that we've come out of. Over any family, it, it supersedes our family of origin. Like you still love your family of origin, but you belong to a different family now. And the Bible is very clear that there will be physical families here on earth that will be torn apart because some will believe and some will not. Nobody's getting to heaven because their mom or their dad believed in Jesus. Nobody's getting to heaven because their older brother believed in Jesus. They're only getting there because they believed in Jesus. So this new family that we're a part of, it supersedes our family of origin. It supersedes our nationality of origin, our skin color of origin, our social status of origin, our economic status of origin. It supersedes everything that happened before because the old has passed away and we are new creatures, new creations, new people in Christ. We belong to a new family and we're supposed to love that family more than we loved even the family we came out of. When Jesus was on the cross, he was dying, he looked down, and he saw the disciple at his feet. He said, you are my brother. So you are my family. This is now your mother. He's talking about his mother. When we enter into this family of God, it's so much bigger and so much grander and so much more important than everything we came out of. And I know sometimes that's hard to feel, it's hard to swallow, it's hard to believe that. But when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, that becomes priority number one. That relationship, that family. And we're supposed to love those brothers. God is our Father, Jesus is the Lord. But we were also co-heirs, like we talked about last week. We were co-heirs with Jesus in the kingdom of God. He is our brother. He's our brother. And Jesus leaves us no room. There's no room in the kingdom of God for any exclusion, any prejudice, any favoritism, any partiality. There's no room for any of that in the family of God. You love your brother who is in Christ with you, or you walk in darkness. You love them. Or you're in darkness. There's no in-between. There's no, there's no happy medium. There's no lukewarm area to stay uh, uh, in that. You abide in the light by loving your brother. By loving your sister in Christ. Or you walk in darkness. No matter what. Not if you agree with them politically. Not if you uh, agree with them the way they live their life. Not if you agree with them because of who they cheer for. Not, not for any reason at all other than they are believers in Christ. Not if they're obedient and love you back. That's not part of it. Like, they don't love me, so I'm not going to love them. You love them like Jesus loved us. Not if they're of the same denomination. Not if they go to the same church. But because they're believers in Christ. There's no reason not to. There's no reason that you could give that if somebody is a believer in Christ, there's no reason that you could give that would mean you don't have to love them. Not if you're comfortable with them. Not if you're friends with them. Not if you hang out all the time. Because they're a family with you in the family of God. We love our brothers and we love our sisters in Christ, period, or we walk in darkness. One of the most destructive forces in the church from from the beginning of time, from the beginning of church, one of the most destructive forces in the church is the idea that you can love Jesus, but not love his followers. That like you have the ability to pick and choose which of his followers you're going to love. You don't have that option. You haven't been given that power. You've been instructed to love them as Jesus loved you. 
And there's probably people sitting here in this church that, that have felt the hatred because if there's not the love, then there is the hatred. You felt the hatred of fellow believers and it drove you away from church or it drove you away from a community or it drove you away maybe even from your relationship with God. There's a chance that at some point you felt that. That you didn't feel the love of your brothers and sisters in Christ and it drove you to change things in your life or it drove you away from church, the church you grew up in, uh, the, the family you grew up in. Our church is full of people who were hurt, who walked away, left for a ton of different reasons, but have come back and have found community. And they found acceptance. And they found the love of other brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we're commanded to do. It's to love. Uh, John 2.11, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. Now the word hate there is a strong word. But it's exactly what John meant to write. Uh, you see, sometimes in our life, and we all get into this, sometimes it's easier to be right than to love. Just because you're right doesn't mean you're loving. They're not the same thing. Sometimes on Facebook, it's a lot easier to be right than it is to be loving. And we all know that's true. We've all probably been on the right side from time to time when we should have been maybe leaning more towards the love side. Sometimes it's easier to place the ministry, doing the work of the ministry, over actually loving people. Sometimes it's easier to come and do the busy work that needs to get done over actually Loving people and loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. But what John tells us throughout 1 John, the three things that uh, the, the two we've talked about and the one we're getting to, he tells us one that we must be right, that we must have sound doctrine. We have to have sound doctrine to stand upon. So we have to be right. We have to do the ministry, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself. But we have to do all that with love. Love for one another. With grace for one another. Forgiveness for one another. And a relationship with one another. Yes, we have to be right. Yes, we have to do the ministry. But we have to do all that with love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, talks specifically about all this. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all, all knowledge, and I have all faith as, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. If I do the ministry, if I'm right all the time, if I'm always doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm doing it without love, then I am nothing. I gain nothing. I am still walking in darkness. The ministry is important. The doctrine is important. The love is important. You can't do one without the others. It takes all three. Now, how many, I'm not going to ask how many of you guys think this, but I think a lot of times when we talk about loving other people, and especially loving other brothers and sisters in Christ, you get that, it's like, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't really hate them, I don't like them, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, it's not that I hate them, it's just I don't really like being around them, I don't want to help them, they're annoying, they bug me, you know, they, they drive me crazy. Uh, I think sometimes we approach ministry with that mindset, I think sometimes we approach relationships in church with that mindset, community with that mindset, uh, but, but here, how many of you guys have ever heard of, um, uh, like the bystander effect or diffusion of responsibility, right? You see these stories about somebody committing a crime or beating somebody up, and there's a crowd of people there, and nobody does anything. Nobody intervenes. Nobody steps in to help. They're all indifferent to what's happening. 
Now what happens is it's, it's, uh, it's called the bystander effect. And what happens is, is there's a diffusion of responsibility. Because if you were the only person watching that, you feel 100% responsible for the safety of that person. So if you're the only one there, you're probably going to intervene. You're probably going to act. You're probably going to do whatever you can to help that person. But you get five people there. You get 10 people there. You get 20 people there. Now you're not 100% responsible anymore. Now you're 20% responsible or 10%. That's what you feel. And so you act less. Even though there's more people there, psychologically, we act less in that situation. We show indifference in those situations. And, and that's the way love and hate works in this relationship. You see, true love demonstrates itself for one another. True love demonstrates. That means true love acts towards one another. But the hatred that we're talking about here is expressed through indifference. You see, true love acts. True love goes. True love serves. True love steps out. True love does the things that we see, that we know need to be done. And hatred towards our brothers and sisters is simply expressed through indifference towards them. Or through assuming that somebody else is going to take care of it. True love acts. And it sounds cheesy, it sounds cliche, but it's truth. It acts. How many of you guys have ever seen a situation, either at a church or in your community, and you saw somebody that was hurting, or somebody that needed something, and you said, man, somebody should do something. I mean, you're right. Somebody should do something. Like that person is struggling at their house. They can't keep it up. And I know this. Somebody should really go do something. Yeah. Somebody should go do something. There's people that, that hurt. There's people that struggle. There's people that have things going on in their lives, man. Somebody should go and do something for them. Somebody should go do something for them. True love is demonstrated by acting. And our hatred is demonstrated through indifference for one another. Don't be indifferent to the people in this room. Don't be indifferent to the people who claim and, and, and profess the blood of Christ in their life. Don't be indifferent to those that are our brothers and sisters in Christ, but show them your love by acting, by going and doing what it is we're called to do. So as we move on here in, in 1 John, uh, the 12 through 14, it's kind of a little, uh, a little poem type thing that he writes. Uh, and I'm not going to read straight through it. I'm actually going to break it up a little bit because there's three different parts that we're going to see in it. Uh, and so I'm going to cover each one. The first is little children, right? So he's talking to the little children. And little children are young believers, right? Young believers. This is where we begin our walk with Jesus. If you uh, come to Christ, like, like right then, like you're a young believer. Like you are a baby in Christ, right? And then, then he talks to the fathers who are men and women of deep faith. These are people that uh, uh, have been Christians, been believers for long periods of time. Like these are like the, like the big, tall, strong oak trees in the forest. Like these are the ones that have been through it and, and uh, have survived and are there. And, and their faith is uh, incredibly large and incredibly strong. And then there's the young men, uh, young women, young men uh, that are no longer children, but they haven't been doing the faith thing quite as long as the father. So we're going to see these three different uh, uh, groups of people that John is talking to here. Uh, and so the first one is little children uh, in uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 12, and then a little bit of 13. It says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Uh, and then it goes on, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. Now here's the deal. For little children in Christ, if you are a babe in Christ, if you are young, if you have just come to know Jesus, then uh, your faith is perfectly uh, displayed, is perfectly showed um, by simply knowing and standing in awe of God. Like when you first come to Jesus and you first realize that your sins are forgiven and you've given it all over to him, it's perfectly fine for you to be in awe of God. 
and to be thankful for what he's done for you. Just to simply be amazed that our sins were forgiven for his name's sake. To know that it wasn't anything that I did. It wasn't anything that I could do. It wasn't anything that I could take care of. But my sins were forgiven because of who? Because of Jesus. And to be in all of that as a child in Christ, as a little child. That's what he's saying. That's, what you sh- that's the relationship you should have with Jesus. That's the relationship you should have with God is, is you are incredible. And you stand in awe and you stand amazed. Now it goes on to the fathers, uh, chapter thir- or verse 13 and verse 14. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And then I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Now it repeats that there for, for emphasis. And it seems like, well, okay, well what's he, what's he saying there? Um, and and here's, here's the truth about spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity has its roots, not in how much you know, not in how much you study, but in time spent with God. Time spent with God. There's no replacement for the amount of time spent with God. If you've been a believer for 50 years and you've been faithful for 50 years and you've spent time with God for 50 years, your faith is going to be so much bigger and so much greater and so much stronger than those around you. There's no replacement, there's no substitute for spending time with God. In fact, in Philippians, Paul is writing, he's talking about uh, all the things he's done, all his accolades, all, all the, the earthly things he's done. But then he goes on and he says, but it all pales in comparison to the fact that he what? That he knows God. The longer we know God, the stronger our faith becomes. There's no substitute for that. You can't take a college course on faith in God. You can't take a a master's class online in faith in God. There's no substitute for spending the time in the Word and in prayer and in meditation and, and in quiet places with God and walking through the fire with God. There's no replacement for that. You want your faith to grow if you want your faith to look like that of your grandfather who you saw in the church every single time it was open for his entire life, if you want faith like that, then you got to spend the time with God that he spent with God. There's no substitute for the time to know God. Now, young men, young men, now young men here, uh, like I said, is, is not children in Christ. They have graduated from being uh, babes in Christ, but they haven't really put in the time and the work uh, to become the fathers yet because there just hasn't been enough time. This is what he says. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now the young men, which is, which is quite frankly where most of us, even, even those of you who are super old, there's not anybody in here that's super old. But any of us that, okay, well, all right, you raise your hand. So uh, there, there are some fathers in this room. There are some people that have been through the fire and stuck with it and, and had, have had a relationship with God for years. There are fathers in this room. But the majority of us, myself included, fall into the young men category. It doesn't matter your physical age, your spiritual age. We fall into the young men category, right? Now, the young men, those who are young, the young men and women in Christ, we are the frontline workers uh, for the work of God. The work of God that is happening is being done by those who are young men here and young women. Those that are no longer children, those that have matured to the point where... uh, They're no longer standing just in awe of God. They still have awe and have reverence for God, but they have begun to develop their own uh, um, spiritual life. They've begun to dive into the Scriptures. They've begun to, the the Word of God abides in their heart. Uh, They've begun to do some of the work that needs to be done. Um, There's a quote here. The proper attribute of youth is to carry on the active parts of life. If soldiers to be engaged in all active service. Have you guys ever heard the, the, the quotes, uh, youth is wasted on the young? Have you guys ever, any of you guys ever said that? 
I say that all the time. I'm just kidding. I don't say that. Like I see like my little kid like running around. I'm like, man, if I had that kind of energy, I would probably still be sitting here. But, uh, <clears throat> but here's the deal. We don't send children off to war, do we? We don't send the elderly off to war. Who do we send to war? The young. The young men, the young women. The greatest effort in the spiritual warfare that's going to happen every single day, uh, day in and day out, is going to be done by the young men. By those that are still young in Christ and still have the strength to do what needs to be done, the, the strength to fight the fights that need to be fought. See, the greatest strength is expected from those that are young. The greatest endurance is expected from those that are young. Now we know that the young men have already overcome the wicked one. If they are believers in Christ, they've already overcome the wicked one. So they have some experience. They know what it takes to fight those battles. Those that are young know what it takes to fight the battles to win. Those that are young. And that's what we and you as the young believers in Christ are called to do. We fight those battles. So as children, we stand in awe of who God is. As fathers, you become a father. You, you've been with God for so long that your faith is so strong. Your prayer life is probably like you probably pray more in a day than I do in a year, I would imagine. But those that are young do the work. Do the work of the church. Do the work of the ministry. Do the work of the missions. The young who have the endurance, who have the strength, is what John is calling them to do. So my question is, are you putting your spiritual strength to work to love your brothers and to love your sisters in Christ? You have been blessed as a young believer. And again, I'm using that word young as somebody who is not a father yet, somebody who has not walked with God for 30 or 40 years, but somebody who is still walking with God and still has strength and endurance to do the things. Greg, you are a young man in Christ. I know you feel old sometimes, but you're a young man in Christ. You still have the strength. You still have the endurance to do the things that we're called to do. Are you putting that strength to work for God? Are you loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? So my encouragement to you today is to do that. If you've overcome the wicked one, then you know what it takes to overcome the wicked one. You have the experience of that battle. You fought it. Now use that knowledge and put it to work to win more people for Christ. Your experience, your endurance, and your strength, all those things can work together to lead other people into a relationship and into this family. Love your brothers and sisters like Jesus loved us. And put your skills to work to show the world who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, God. Guys, I want to lift up this, this group of people to you right now, God, and I pray that, uh, that you would, as a whole, as a group, God, that you would strengthen us. God, that you would teach us, that you would give us knowledge, and that you would give us wisdom to be able to do the work that you have called us to do, God. God, I pray that there's anybody in here who needs to ask forgiveness uh, because they haven't loved their brothers or sisters the way you have called us to do, God. If they need to ask forgiveness and they need to step out of the darkness and into the light, God, I pray that they would spend just a moment doing that. 
that if they had some relationships in their life where they know those relationships don't honor you, that they would spend some time getting those right. The world knows that we belong to you because of how we love one another. So God, let us love one another the way Jesus loved us. Let us give sacrificially to one another. Let us serve sacrificially one another. God, let us be there for one another in in the high points and in the low points, God. God, make us a family. God, I pray that we would do what you have called us to do. That when we see somebody who has a need, we wouldn't think to ourselves, somebody should do something. But we think to ourselves, God, what can I do? What can I do to help this person? What can I do to serve this person? What can I do to be there for that person, God? God, I don't want to think any longer. Somebody should do something. So every time you feel in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, that thought of somebody should do something, start to creep in. I want you to stop it and simply think, what can I do? We're going to stop putting it off on somebody else. We're going to stop expecting other people to take care of it. We as believers, it's our job to start doing something whenever we see a need. God, we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross in our place. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins, God. We thank you for inviting us into this family to become co-heirs with Christ in the kingdom of God. We thank you for that. We give you all the glory. We stand in awe of who you are. Thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.